All right. Good evening, everybody. Good to see everybody tonight. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to be starting a new series called Constructing Your Life for Victory. And so this is, I'm not sure how many parts this is going to be. I'm sure it won't be any more than 20. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of constructing to do. <laughs> anyway, uh, tonight's uh, part one is called Rendering the Plans, Preparing the Site. And so this is something that the Lord dropped into my heart this week uh, based on this scripture in Matthew 7, uh, 24 through 27. But before we actually get to the scripture, let's go ahead and look at the overview. Wisely build the house of your life solidly on the word of God to be victorious over every storms of these, over the storms of these last days. We have been called to these last days. Maybe not by choice, but by the fact that you're here, that you're alive in this particular time in history. You have been called because you are Christians, and the Lord has enlisted all of us into his army to be part of of the end time army to help usher in the return of Jesus. Let's go ahead and read our text in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth the sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded on the rock. Verse 26, And everyone that hears these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now this is Matthew's version of this particular teaching of Jesus. Now let's read the same teaching from Luke. And this is Luke's, what Luke heard. Now, in making this comparison between Matthew and Luke, please don't think anything about that either one of them are wrong or incorrect. They're both right in what they heard Jesus say, because the word of God is correct. So, they simply picked up different emphases and different points that were said. Luke, in chapter 6, verses 46 through 49, says this, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not, is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin 
of that house was great. So we are going to spend the next few times with this uh, particular series, building our house. So we're going to construct our house, the house of our lives. And so we're going to start with today, rendering the plans and preparing the site where the house is going to go, where the house of our life is going to rest. And then we're going to build a foundation. Not tonight, but next time. We're going to build a foundation. We're going to start the structure. We're going to do the framing. And we're going to do the roofing. We're going to then put in all the utilities that belong in there, the plumbing and the electric. We are going to um, put the finish on it on the outside and the inside, the flooring, the paint, and we're going to end up with a house that is well built to be able to withstand the storms of life, to be able to withstand the storms of these end times. So we're going to put this together piece by piece, structure by structure, so that our lives can rest upon the Word of God. And every part of it is, is important. Because a house may have a firm, solid foundation. But if the walls are flimsy, and if the roof is hardly held on, that wind is going to destroy it as much as if it had no foundation. So every part is important. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at the framing and the roofing and the, the structure of the house and everything that goes in it in order to see how it is that we build a solid house. And the reason why we want to do this is because we are in the end times. Now in Acts 13.36, it says that David served the Lord in his generation. So David, talking about King David, lived his life in a particular time in history. And in that particular time in history in which he lived, he served the will of God. He did what God wanted him to do. And so we live, though, in a different time. And no matter whether we're talking... Um, well, let me, let me go about it another way. Whether you're talking about somebody that lived in the... Uh, time when the Romans were um, persecuting the church or the time in the Middle Ages or whether you're talking about in the Reformation and, uh, and the various things that happened in that, the, some of the persecutions that went on. You talk about any point in a slice of history people had to build their house to withstand the storms of those times. And so I'm saying that we need to build our house in such a way as to withstand the storms of these end times for what's coming. And I tell you what, these times, the scripture tells us, are not going to be like any other times. And so we need to build a solid structure based on a solid foundation, based on the bedrock of the word of God, of hearing and doing the word of God. We need to use God-given construction materials, methods, and tools. Because if they're not God-given, if they're based on something other than the Word of God, based upon if they're not based upon hearing and doing, it's bound for failure. So we want to build it solidly with construction, God's given construction materials, his methods of building it, and the tools that he has provided to build it. And one of the key tools, one of the key things, is being a hearer and doer of the word. Notice in both of those scriptures, it starts out by saying, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and does them. So notice, first of all, that it is a whosoever. Whosoever. Doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. It doesn't matter 
your skill level or your lack of skill level. Those kind of things don't matter. It says whosoever builds or hears God's words, hears what God has to say, hears what Jesus has told us, <coughs> and does them. We are familiar with the scripture in James chapter 1 about being a hearer and doer, but I want us to go ahead and look at that again. So if you turn in your Bibles, please, to James chapter 1 about hearing and doing. First of all, verse, let's start with verse 21. Wherefore, lay aside, or lay apart, all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, which means quit sinning. Okay, has everybody got that? Quit sinning. <laughs> um, okay. And receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to deliver or to save your souls. So receive the engrafted word with meekness. It's an attitude in which we need to come to the word of God with meekness, with humility, because we don't know everything he does. And so we come to the word with humility, with, with meekness, which is power under control. So we come to the word and we say, Father, show us your word. Show us your word. So we receive it with meekness. And it is the engrafted word. We're going to talk a lot about that today, about it being engrafted into our lives. So it becomes part of who we are, part of our core value system. That is so important. I mean, that's what this whole lesson today is based on, is hearing and doing and the importance <coughs> excuse me, of building our life on the bedrock of the word of God. That is the most important thing. That's what we're going to be talking about in, in depth tonight. But we have some preliminary things we need to talk about, one of which is being a hearer and a doer of the word. Most everyone hears the word of God. I'm talking about Christians. They hear the word of God. What separates us is being a doer of the word. Jesus said in, Rome, in uh, John 8, 31 and 32, he said to those Jews that believed on him. So they had heard something. They, they believed. He who continues in my word. Same thing. If we continue in the word, we become a disciple. If we don't continue in the word, if we aren't a doer that hears and does and hears and does and hears and does, then it's, it's only the doers that and the, those that continue in the word that know the truth and get set free in this life. Actually, it doesn't say get set free. It actually says are made free. If you spend time in the word of God, if you are being a doer, the result will be one day you'll wake up and you say, wow, I am free. Because the word makes us free. It's something that the word does. That's what it is designed to do. Let's go on in verse 22 of James chapter 1. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If you think you're just going to sit here and hear and not do anything and get the outcomes that you want in your life, it ain't going to work. It's not going to work. You're deceiving yourselves. It's a strong word tonight because we're, we're coming upon bad times and we need to build our lives correctly on the word of God. Verse 23, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a mirror, he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. 
We can look at this in two ways. One is when you look in the mirror, we're talking about the mirror of God's word, and you see where you fall short, then those are things that need to be corrected in your life. If I stand in front of the mirror and I see my hair sticking out all over the place, and I say, wow, and then I say, well, I've got other things to do, and I take off, and I never correct what I see, then I go around in my life with this, you know, if you want to put it in, in, uh, in, in, in the Christian spiritual context, we go around with our sins hanging out all over the place, and everybody knows it, and we think we're doing good. <laughs> right? But we got this sin, everybody sees our fear, everybody sees our unforgiveness, everybody sees our, our spirit of rejection, and we think we're doing okay. No, we need to look into the Word and see what the Word says and correct ourselves by the Word of God. The Scripture tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Of those four things, two of them have to do with correcting ourselves. It's given for rebuke, in other words, to show us what is wrong, and for correction so that we see ourselves and then how to correct it. So that's one way of looking at, looking into the mirror of God's word. The other way of looking at the mirror of God's word is it is reflecting back to us what we, what we are in Christ Jesus, what we need to then live up to as sons of God. And we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. It shows us what we need to live up to. So we can be a doer of the word by getting rid of the stuff that the word shows us and need to get rid of, or we can be a doer of the word by doing the things that it says that we are to do to act on the things that we are in Christ Jesus. Uh, verse 25, For whoever so looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, does it, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So to be blessed, in other words, to have the outcome of doing the word, to be set free, to use what we looked at in John, we need to be a doer of the word. It needs to be our basic heart attitude. Father, I'm going to obey you. When we are a doer of the word, doing the word is what causes it to become engrafted into our hearts, to become a part of our core value system. It's the doing of the word. Because once we see what the word says and we begin to do it, and we see that there is an out, a good outcome, we begin to trust it more and more, and, and it gets to the point where it gets down into our heart, and we can say, you know what, I can rely on this word. You know, healing is a good example. You know, we start out with, with believing God and trusting God for the, the simpler things, when challenges of a cold start coming upon us, or challenges of a headache or something, and we begin to stand on the word of God and do the things that we have learned, to do the affirmations, to stay in the kingdom of God, and these kind of things, and we see the result. Wow, the headache goes. And we don't have to take an aspirin to do it. We become, we realize that God's word works. And so the more we do that, the more we are doing the word, stepping out in faith, then the, we see the outcome and it causes it to become engrafted. So then when a bigger challenge comes, we don't automatically panic and say, oh my gosh, I better call 911. We say, no, wait a second. I know what God's word has done for me. I believe God's word. And so in the name of Jesus, every devil behind this, you go in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to accept this challenge in my life. Being a hearer and a doer of the word. Okay, ready to start our construction project? Okay, the first thing is to dream. Dream big. 
Dream big. Now, if you were building a house for yourself and you had unlimited finances, ooh, think about that dream house that you would build. How many rooms would it have? How many bathrooms would it have? Right? Would it be a tall three-story house? Would it be a, a, a ranch style that's spread out for acres? How big would it be and how many rooms? Think about your dream house. Woo! Well, you know what? <laughs> it can come with a maid. <laughs> so, you know, when somebody is going to build a house, build a structure, they have to have a vision for what that structure is going to be like. What is it that they're trying to build? What, what do they want it to look like? What are the aspects of it that they need to have, that they want to have? Well, we need to do the same thing when we're building our life. But when we're building our life on Jesus Christ, what is it that we want? What, how many, how many wonderful things do we want to have? How many of the blessings of God and the, um, and the promises of God do we want to have in our life? We want them all, don't we? We need to dream big. I think it was Zig Ziglar said, if you're going to think big, if you're going to think, you might as well think big. So let's think big. And so what is it that God has called us to be? What is all these blessings? What kind of life does he call us to have? A life that is the life of a son of God, manifesting the fullness of the Father to the world. And we are sons of God. We are children of God. So let's manifest him. We want to dream. How can I manifest him to the world? How can I be a manifested son of God? Living in the power and the glory and the uh, authority that we have in Christ Jesus. Affecting this world and the people around us. As an ambassador, ministering the gospel in love and in power to those around us. We have been called as an ambassador. That needs to be part of our house, our dream of what life we want to build. To be that glorious church, displaying the righteousness of God through our lives. These are w things that we can think about. What is it that we want in a life that is built on Jesus Christ for these last days? A house that will stand and withstand. We are here to help usher in the return of Jesus, which means that we are to be preparing the way. 2 Peter 3, verses 11 and 12 says, Because we see these things coming, the destruction of the heavens and earth by fire, what sort of holy people, or what sort of people are we to be in holy conversation and lifestyle? Hastening, looking for and hastening the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. So that's part of our preparation by being a holy, uh, perfect person. That glorious church, of course, without spot or wrinkle. So we need to think about what it is that we want. What do we want our life to look like? That is, the, that is rendering the plans. Because what you do when you're building a house, you, you dream about all these things that you want, and then you got to put it in some kind of, of uh, like a floor plan. So you lay it out. What is the floor plan? What's this house going to look like? How many rooms and where are they going to be situated? Is there going to be a long hallway or a short hallway? Do you want a big kitchen or a little kitchen? And do you want a bathroom in every room or, or one big bathroom with four doors going to all different rooms? <laughs> That's not a Jack and Jill. That's a Jack and Jill and Jack and Jill and Jack and Jill and Jack and Jill, and Jack and Jill bathroom. Okay. <laughs> and a couple other people too. Okay. <laughs> now, one of the things we have to remember is that in order to go high, in order, the bigger the structure that you build, the bigger the uh, uh, impact that you want to have that, that, that you want that building to have on those around you, that means the deeper you need to go. 
Like when they build a skyscraper, they, they don't just have a little foundation like this house has. It has a deep, deep foundation that uh, is almost as deep as the building is tall, founded on bedrock. And so we, in order, the bigger our structure, the deeper that we need to go. That's why Paul in Philippians uh, chapter 3 Philippians chapter 3, he says, Not that I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, that I may apprehend that for which I was apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God will reveal this even, or reveal even this unto you. So Paul was seeking to go high, but notice what he did is he, set aside those things from the past. So we need to look at our lives and say, what is it that's hindering me? Because we need to go deep in, uh, in getting rid of these things in our life. Go deep so that we can go high. The other thing that we need to do is we need to count the cost. What is it that's gonna, what is it going to take to accomplish what we want? Look at Jesus' words in Luke chapter 14. Now it starts off by saying that there was a multitude that was following him. I'm looking at verse 25. There's a great multitude following him. You know, most pastors like the idea of a great multitude following them, right? Filling their church, paying their tithes, giving their offerings. But look what Jesus did. This great multitude was following him. And this is what he said. He turned around and he said to them, If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now that is no way to keep a large congregation <laughs> coming back every week. <laughs> right? It sounds tough and offensive, but you know what? In order to be here when Jesus comes again, we've got to listen to words like this. Remember how we started? Be a hearer and a doer of the words of Jesus. These are the words of Jesus. Verse 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? So it's important when we embark on this building project that we are willing to pay the cost, to pay the price in order to see it through to the end. Verse 29, Less happily after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. Saying, this man began to build, but was not able to finish. So we don't want to just build a foundation and then ignore the rest. We need to build the total structure. Verse 31, Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consult whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and 
desires conditions of peace. Verse 33, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Now I want, you, I want to remind you what the definition of a disciple is. He that continues in my word is a disciple. So here it says, if you're not willing to, to forsake all, everything, who you are, what you have, what you've done, what your dreams and plans for your life are. If you're not willing to forsake those, you cannot be one that is a disciple. You can't continue in his word and be set free if you're not willing to do that. So part of preparing for this structure is to look at the cost and are you willing to pay the cost, the price. Now we're going to go on to the next part. You've got your plans laid out. You know what you're wanting to do. You've got your budget all put together. You're ready to go. But now you need to acquire the tools. What tools, what things do you need to bring together to build this house. So we want to talk about some of the spiritual tools. Now tools, there are general tools which are used throughout the whole structure. There are specific tools that just apply to certain aspects of building. So like a hammer, for instance, would be one that's used throughout the whole construction process. So it's something that's, that's used constantly. There may be other, uh, you know, plumbing tools or different things like that that are very specific to a certain task, to a certain job. So you use those when they need to be used, but they're not necessarily ones that would be used all the time. What I've tried to point out here um, are ones that we need to use on a consistent basis in every part of the structure, whether you're talking about the foundation, whether you're talking about the framing, uh, the finishing, whatever it is. Uh, these are tools that are important for us to always be using. Confessing our sins regularly. Uh, most of us have heard these things before. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Uh, we need to speak the word over our life, doing affirmations. And I've given us some of the key ones here that we consistently refer to, having the mind of Christ, the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart being pleasing to Him, reckoning ourselves dead to sin, alive unto God, living unto, unto righteousness. These are tools that should be constantly applied. And we'll talk some more about that in a few minutes. Um, and then, of course, any other tool, any other affirmation that would be necessary uh, for whatever you need in your life as you're going through this process. Number three, being a hearer and doer. We've already talked about the importance of this, but just remember that as you go through each part of this process of building your house, you need to con continually be a hearer and doer. It's an important tool in building our house. Prayer, uh, effective prayer. Not just God bless all the people all over the world. You know, we need effective, specific prayer. So here are some that we uh, look to often. The morning prayer. Uh, foundational prayers based on Psalm 23, Psalm 91, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul's prayer there, Ephesians chapter 3, again Paul's prayer, and then Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, which is also a prayer of Paul. And an important part of that prayer, praying, is also forgiving others from your heart on a regular basis. And then number five, communion. Communion on a daily basis, on a regular basis, because it daily reminds us of all that Jesus has done for us. Okay, that's the introduction. Okay, now I want to get to the real meat of what we're talking about tonight. Building and preparing the site. First of all, we dig deep to the rock, to the foundation, God's word, the bedrock of the word of God. Notice in 
the passage in Luke, if you look back on, on the first page there, it says, verse 48, he is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. So we need to dig deep. And what I mean by that is don't look to the, to the things that you've learned in the past. Don't look to all the isms, the philosophies, the denominationalism, the worldly ideas, uh, the idols in your, in your life, sins, youthful lusts. We need to rid ourselves of all that stuff. The bedrock needs to be clean so that all we have left is the pure word of God. This is very important. Colossians chapter 2, verses uh, 7 through 10. Talk about this. He says that we are to be rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thankfulness. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Not after Christ. For in him... In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him. When our lives are founded on the word, we are complete in him. But it needs to be the pure word of God. The pure word of God. You, letter B there under D1, letter B, you can trust the word with your life, your finances, your protection, your health, your relationships, your vocation, your ministry, every aspect of your life. We need to realize that the word of God is true. It's not the word of God, but the word of God and the word of God if. It is the word of God. We need to put the full weight of our being on God and on his word. One aspect I want to talk about tonight that the Lord was ministering to me about this morning is dealing with emotions. Now, emotions, for a lot of us, can easily take us off of God's Word. We need to realize a couple of things about emotions. Emotions are responders. Every single emotion is a response to the way that you think. It's a response to your core value. Let me give you an example. In Chicago, in downtown Chicago, there was a homeless man who was very demonized. And one day something happened that set him off. He's going down the street, screaming like a madman. And he's swinging at everybody that he could get anywhere close to. And everybody is reacting in fear. Right? Because they think, this man's crazy. This man is dangerous. This man can hurt me. And they were backing off. But one man looked at that situation he didn't, he didn't experience fear under his breath. He bound the demons in that man. He walked up to that man, and he said, Brother, what's going on? He stole my hamburger. I mean, that's what was setting him off. Somebody had taken his food. And so he, he comforted that man. He led him to Christ. Because he looked at, he had a different mindset. See, the emotion of fear in everybody else was based on their mindset. 
this man's crazy and dangerous. I don't want him hurting me. And so they're backing off as far as they can. But he had a different mindset. And every, see, he had a mindset based on the word of God, on who he was in Christ. And that is so important. Every emotion that we have is a responder to, way, to the way we think. And so if you are with somebody and you get offended, they say something and you react to it. There's an emotional response. Now that is based on the way that you're thinking. And we always need to be thinking and learning how to think on the word of God. What does the word say? How should I res be responding to this situation? It's not my emotions are saying I should be angry. No, it's, wait a second, what does God's word say? Oh, God's word says forgive. Don't take offense. So it's like, oh, okay. And you don't let it get, go there. So no matter what happens in your life, it's, you've always got, you've got to learn to think according to the word of God with everything. You get a letter in the mail that says that the incident that happened nine months ago that you thought was resolved, all of a sudden you've got a summons from court for a small claim because that person thinks that you owe them some money. Now you can react according to the word of God or you can react out of, oh my gosh, fear, panic, all this kind of stuff. What is your thinking based on? It needs to be based on the word of God. So something like that happens, you say, wait a second. God is my deliverer. I'm not going to fear. He can take care of this. And we stand on God's word. We don't let our emotions take control of us. There was a pastor who had a, uh, some horses. And one of the horses that he had uh, he called it barely broke. In other words, he had, he had broken it, but he hadn't had enough time to really perfect it, to, you know, so it would, it would obey him the way uh, he wanted. A family came out to his ranch, and he, they had a seven-year-old boy. And so he spent some time with the Word of God and with the seven-year-old boy teaching him from the Word how to control this horse. And so this seven-year-old boy learned how to control the horse. We put bits in horses' mouths to, to control them. You know, scriptures like that from uh, Psalms and from uh, first, uh, or first Timothy, I mean, I'm sorry, James chapter 3. So he taught that boy how to control the horse and exactly what to do based on the word of God to control the horse. So that seven-year-old boy had a wonderful time. Two hours riding that horse, no problem whatsoever. Well, that family left, and some, some other people came over. And one of them was a 22-year-old man uh, who thought he knew everything. And so he also was going to let him ride this horse. He said, I tell you what, let me instruct you about some things about how to handle this horse. So, ah, no, no, I've, I've been riding horses all my life. I know what to do. So he gets on the horse. Five minutes later, he is thrown over a fence uh, onto the ground and was, uh, was injured pretty badly. So because he didn't know how to control the horse. And it's a lot that way with our emotions. The word of God needs to be that rain. So when a situation comes that begins to engender emotion, what do we do? We say, wait a second, what does the word of God say? Because if you give rain to that emotion, it will run off right out from under you. And before you know it, you're carried along on the emotion. You need to learn how to rein in that emotion by thinking what the word of God thinks. See, this is one of the aspects of basing our life on the foundation of the word of God. The pure word of God. Our life needs to be based on the word. I don't know how to say it any stronger, any harder. It needs to be based on God's word. 
there needs, we need to set in our lives the cornerstone. As we build this foundation on this bedrock, we have to have a cornerstone. And the scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that Jesus is the cornerstone. So what, is that, what does that mean? The cornerstone is the key piece to the building. Because it is from the cornerstone that everything is measured. It's from the cornerstone that everything is made square. It's from the cornerstone that the height, not the height, but the, the fact that it's, it's completely vertical, that it's straight and not, you know, leaning like the Tower of Pisa, right? It's based on the cornerstone. Well, the cornerstone is Jesus Christ. The foundation is laid according to the cornerstone. So that's why we look at what is it that Jesus has said. What does the word of God tell us? And we stay in line in our lives when we are building the house, building our life based on that cornerstone. Based on the exact measurements of that cornerstone. The exact dimensions based on that cornerstone. That is how we keep our lives straight and in line with the Word of God and building it in a way that will remain. So we set the cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. He's got to be the center of our life, the center of our existence, the center of why we live. We, everything should look back to Jesus. Is this what Jesus wants me to do? Is this what, how I should be living my life? Is this activity what Jesus wants me to be involved in? I was watching a movie the other night we had watched it, I don't know what, maybe a year ago, a year and a, almost two years ago. We had watched this movie, and it was a good movie. The other night, I thought, oh, got a little time here. I'll, I'll watch the movie before I go to sleep. And I put that movie on, and I wasn't very far into it, and all of a sudden, there's this curse word. And I said, what? I don't remember there being any curse words in this movie. And so... I thought, well, maybe that's a rare. Let me, see, let me watch it a little bit further. And then, you know, another few minutes, there's another curse word. Wait a second. I, don't re I, I really, I didn't remember there being any curse words in this movie. I had seen it a couple of times. And so I thought, well, let me watch it just a little bit more. If there's one more curse word, that's it. And so, sure enough, a few minutes later, another curse word. I said, okay, that's it. Turn it off. See, as I have been learning to walk in righteousness and basing my life on Jesus Christ and, and what his word has to say, I, it's like, you know what, I don't want to do that kind of stuff. Just before, I guess I heard it, but it didn't have any effect. This time I heard it and it's like, Ew. you know, it just, uh, what God's been doing in my life, it just, it just rattled it. And so I was like, no, I'm not going to expose myself to that. Turn that movie off and, and go to sleep. <laughs> so, um, another way of looking at building, or another illustration of building our life on the rock, there was a, a man that uh, was looking at buying this, uh, this house, he was interested in it. Um, the owner uh, had been trying to sell it for some time and hadn't been able to sell it. He kept lowering the price, lowering the price, but nobody would buy it. And it was, it was abandoned uh, after a couple of years. Uh, I mean, it looked abandoned. The weeds were all grown up and the shutters were coming off and it was a terrible mess. But this man was interested in it. So he thought, and he saw the same thing, that what, what had happened, the reason people wouldn't buy it is because it was obvious by looking at the house and, and some of the things around the house that the foundation had shifted. And so it's like people were saying, oh, no, no, I'm not going to get involved in that. So, but he went a step further. He went down to the county and he looked at the records for that house. And he found out something that nobody else had taken the time to go find out. And that is that a previous owner, unbeknownst to the current owner, a previous owner had, had 
been having that ex uh, situation with the with the uh, foundation shifting, and he found uh, got a company, and they did peerings down to bedrock in in just the right places. So he knew that there's nothing wrong with this house. This house is solid because it's built on the bedrock. And so he was able to buy that house at a very good price and very good terms because he knew something that the other people didn't know. But, and see, when our life is built on the rock, when our life is founded on the rock of the Word of God, it is solid and it will give us the ability to withstand the storms in these last times. Just like that house was there to stay and it could withstand whatever might come against it. We need to excavate the footings. One of the important parts about starting the foundation is you've got to have the footings dug. And what are the footings of our life? I would say there's probably others, but two of them that are really important is faith and love. Faith, because we have to trust and believe God's word, put our faith in it. But we also know that faith works by love, by understanding that God loves us. And because he loves us, we can love ourselves. And because we love ourselves, we can love others. So he loves us, we love him. Because of the work he's done in our life, we love ourselves and then we can love others. So by the love of God and faith in his word, we dig the footings. And one of the most crucial things about digging the footings is that you need to let the concrete cure. You pour the footings, but then you don't come back the next day and start building the building. The concrete has to cure. And so what happens when the concrete is curing? Construction stops. Because you can't build until that concrete is secure. So, or cured. So what does that mean for us spiritually? That is, we need to let the concrete of the footings cure by patiently doing the word. In <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 it says there after well, let me get to it here real quick it says for you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God you might receive the promise so curing is a patient activity when we are building our house, there comes times when we need to let the things that we are learning and the things that we are doing cure. We need to be practicing it and practicing it, doing it and doing it until we know that it can hold the next part of our growth. It's, it's an important aspect of of this. We don't just slap all these things into our life and expect us to be able to withstand the storms. We have to let the structure be settled, let the structure be strong, and that happens, the structure of our, house, of our spiritual house happens as we continue to practice and doing God's word so that by faith we know without any doubt that God's word is true and it is going to hold us. So recommendations for phase one of the, of the construction. Number one, get a tool belt for your tools and wear it constantly. And that tool belt is called lifestyle. So go back and look at those tools that we mentioned earlier. Are those part of your lifestyle? Are they in your tool belt? Because you're going to need them as you build your life, of confessing your sins, of doing the word, of speaking the word over your life, of having prayer, effective prayer, forgiving others, and communion. These are tools of a lifestyle that we need to have in our life. 
So get the tool belt and start using it as part of your lifestyle. Number two, write out your vision for the dream house of your life. And what are the key components that you want in your life for these end times? So think about that. You know, we kind of went over that, but I'm sure you didn't have much chance to think about what you want for your life. So you might want to consider this homework for you to do. Write out your vision for your life. It says in um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, that God framed the world with his words. So we need to think about what it is that we want to build, what we want our house to look like, what we want the house of our life to look like so that we can properly put it together. So write that out. And then number two, or number three, evaluate your relationship to the word. Ask for wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God to know that you know that you can trust all that you are and all that you have to God and his word. So these are important aspects as we begin this structure of our life and this building process. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.